just really looking for a lot of help right now. Like I. Hey, hey, listen. Don't worry about it, man. I got you, bro. I got you. I got you. Trust me. You can trust me. I, I got your back. Look, trust me, man. I got you. Don't worry. I got you. Confia me. Todo va a estar bien. Today we start the new series, Trust Issues, and I think it fits with this. By the way, if you have any heart towards these young people in this next generation, and if you'd like to invest in them in any way, please come talk to me personally. We're going to work on building teams and building those who can help us minister. As we talk about this idea of trust issues, my question would be, when you hear those two words, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Maybe for many of us, it's the media, politicians, leaders, those in power. But truthfully, it could be your spouse, your kids, family, friends. What is it for you? For some of us, we could be sarcastic about it. We can joke about it all day long. But the truth is, is that it causes a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. Trust is tough and something that many of us don't talk about very often. We're headed to Tennessee for my granddaughter, granddaughter number two's first birthday. We get to leave Tuesday. We'll be gone for a little bit, but we're excited. We haven't been there in a while. It was a big part of life. We lived there for four years and got a lot of friends. My brother and his wife and kids are there. And um, honestly, I miss my kids. Granddaughter number one, (laughs) Adeline. She lived with us for a year and a half, and I can't tell you how many nights I got to rock her to sleep. For some reason, Grandpa knew how to do it. But I miss him, and so we, we've been talking about it, trying to make it happen for a while, and honestly, we were kind of feeling like, ah, eh, just wasn't going to work out. Just too much stuff. Just, just we'll, we'll figure it out another time. And Well, we did everything we could, and we worked it out. So uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I were looking at flights, and without going into all the details, we, we couldn't use our Southwest points, and so we were looking at the best price flights, and uh, anyone want to guess what airline we're flying? <sighs> yeah, of course, of course you heard it. Everybody knows, everybody knows. <laughs> anyone order a cyber truck off Timu yet? No, of course not. So, but, I mean, here's the thing. We've flown Spirit before. My wife said, Never again. If, if you work for Spirit or if you're involved in Spirit Airlines at all, please do not take this personal. We're, I, we're getting somewhere, all right, here. Um, but what's the problem? What's wrong with Spirit? I'll tell you, we don't trust them. Honestly, right? We don't trust them. We don't trust that we're going to have a good experience. We don't trust that it's going to be comfortable. We don't trust that everything's going to go the way we hope it will. Why? Because maybe we've heard from others. Maybe they've failed in that area, or so we say, so we think. And arguably, maybe they have that reputation of doing so again and again, and it is what it is, prime example of what you get what you pay for. But let me pose a question to think about as we walk through this idea of trust issues. How do we separate someone from something? I think that's one of the most difficult things is to separate someone from something. And and in all honesty, separating a person from their mistakes, a person from their sins, a person from their weaknesses, shortcomings, you name it, is very, very important. See, if I don't want to be identified by my mistakes or my failures or, God forbid, my weaknesses... I should easily be able to treat others the same way I want to be treated, right? Not so fast. What about when others don't treat me in that same way? Am I supposed to just take it on the chin over and over again? I mean, yeah. No. Not really. <laughs> That's why we're here right now. How do we handle our trust issues? Some very, 
justifiable and personal. In Proverbs chapter three, verse one through six, it says this, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Submit to him and he will make your path straight. Let's break it down for just a second. Proverbs 3 says his commands, teachings, will, way, however you want to put it, keep them in your hearts. And what? You'll have a long life of peace and prosperity. Now, we obviously know that God's not here to just make us rich and just keep on blessing us with a whole bunch of prosperity and prosperity. That word can mean many different things. But he says here, you'll have that life if you keep my ways. Also, let love and faithfulness be with you always. And here, listen to this. Then you will find favor with both God and man. Imagine that. Imagine following Jesus, being a little bit like him, doing our best to be like him and and finding out that, wow, that really finds favor with God. So he's blessing me in the ways that he says he will. But not only that, but I'm finding favor with those around me. Can I tell you something? The more I look and act like Jesus, the more I find favor with those around me. Anybody else feel that way? Anybody else see that? Now, there's a lot of different interpretations of looking and acting like Jesus, but it's all in the word. Some of us think that the the turning tables Jesus was the one. Well, hey, you know, sometimes we got to do that. He did it once. I mean, there's one time, and it was very specific, and there was a strong reason for it. Who's the Jesus that we're representing? What do we look like? Are we finding favor by acting like him? I mean, In all honesty, I feel like there's the answer to our trust issues. Let love and faithfulness be with you always. Then you will find favor with both God and man. Done. We got to finish. The best part's coming. It says, trust in the Lord. And don't try to understand it. Simply put. See, the understanding we have is based on what? Experience. What we've experienced. What we've been through. And since we're failed constantly, forgive us, Lord, for not trusting you, right? That's kind of how we feel. Well, I got an issue with trust, so, I mean, it's really hard to trust in God. That's exactly why he says don't do that. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to understand it because you will not. You will see this this way, and you will see me the same way. Can I tell you something? Our failure to trust is the only way to trust in him. Failure to trust what we've experienced from those around us as how he's going to treat us. Just because we've been failed so many times doesn't mean that he's ever going to fail us. But yet, sometimes it feels like when we're failed, it's him, right? But it's not. It's someone else who's been failed. It's someone else who's struggling, who also is dealing with trust issues. Last week we read, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. Jesus himself said, why are you persecuting me? Man, that would hurt. It really would hurt if Jesus said that to me. Why are you persecuting me? What do I have to stop immediately? What did I do? But yet it might be a little bit more common than we think. There's only one thing that we can truly trust in and out of this world, and it's Jesus. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit that lives within us. This world will always fail us. You can't trust anyone, but you'll never be able to live that way. Even the absolute best this world has to offer will fail us. We all will. 
not God. That's what he's trying to say here. Stop looking at that as your example. Look to me. Let me be your example. It'll change the way you see those around you. And you might find favor with me and them. We talk a whole lot about this idea that all of us are God's children. And if that's the case, then he loves us all the same, which means he also is brokenhearted over our trust issues. He doesn't want you hurting. He doesn't want you in pain. He doesn't want you to constantly relive those things. He doesn't want you to walk in that. He wants you to walk with him. He says, stop trying to figure it out. I think it could be put very simply, follow Jesus, love like Jesus, be faithful and trust in Jesus. There, there's a three-point message done. But simply put, honestly, those are the three things that he says in Scripture. Do those things, and you'll live a long life of peace and prosperity, and you'll find favor with God and man, and I will bless you. And also, I'll take care of everything that's in front of you. I'll make your path straight. This passage in Hebrew, that idea of path there, alludes to the path a king would take, the most comfortable, consistent way he could take to stay steady on the course, to stay secure, to make sure that it was a comfortable ride, to make sure that everything was as it should be. And that's what the Bible's saying right here, is that he will make your path straight. Not just so that you can be on the straight, narrow way, so you can do things right. No, he will make your path straight. He'll make everything in front of you a smooth sail. You say, well, what about persecution? What about all these things? Yes, I believe that at times we will go through trials and we will deal with persecution in some way or another. Nothing like what true persecution is here in America. But the word says that if we act and look like him and follow him, that that's not necessarily what he's going to allow us to walk through. He says, I'll make your path straight. I'll make sure that things are okay in your way. God says, trust me, and I'll take care of you. John 10, verse 7 through 11 says, Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What Jesus is saying is remember who the shepherd is and you'll be taken care of. The only other option is the opposite. It's not, well, I mean, I can kind of get a half, I can get like, how about I just get a happy medium? No, the only other way is the opposite. All before me, all but me, lead to destruction. So why should we trust him? Why should we trust Jesus? It's because he's proven worthy. Let me try and make it clear. Jesus invites us to trust him not because he's God or because he said so. That's so hard to swallow. Not because he just said, that's it. You need to trust me and things will go better for you. That's not the way God talks to us. Or because we feel obligated to, but because he's proven trustworthy by laying down his life for you and I, refusing to ever leave or forsake us, caring for our specific needs and showing us he understands how it feels to be us by becoming flesh becoming man and becoming us. He did all of this to restore his relationship with you and I. We were created for this very thing, to see this life through the lens of Jesus, to follow him and walk a straight path. The kind of connection, contentment, and communion you were created for all require trust. And the truth is, 
Everyone in this world, even those we love most, will fail us. So where is our trust? In Jesus. Why? Because he's the only one who can fix our trust issues. Some of us have gone to counseling for years, and it feels like, it's not getting anywhere. What's happening? Don't get me wrong, please. There's absolute necessities in life. But sometimes we have to just surrender it to Jesus and say, you know what? I'll take the counsel as well, but God, I gotta give this to you. I gotta give this to you. Of course I'm gonna take counsel. Of course I'm gonna have a community that supports me. Of course I'm gonna find those who speak into my life, but I'm gonna find you first. Jesus fixes our trust issues by transforming us into a trustworthy follower of him, knowing that our hope, our source, our identity, our worth, our value and purpose are all found in him. It says in the scripture we just read, and you will find favor with God and man. You wanna work on trust issues? Work on trusting him. Work on trusting Jesus. He'll take care of it from there. The church is a community. None of you are alone. We're here together doing the same thing, pursuing what God has for us right? Everybody's got a little bit of a different interpretation of that, but that's why you're here this morning. You're not here on accident. You're not here because, well, somebody invited me, so I just, I'm just, yeah, I'm just here, you know? No, you're here on purpose. God brought you here. He wants you to be a part of a community, whether it's this community or not. We need each other. We're created to have communion with not only God, but with each other. We're created to break bread with one another. Maybe, maybe we need to evaluate some things in life. Maybe we need to ask ourselves some questions. I'll tell you what. Ask a couple people close to you. Is it easy to trust me? Do you feel trusted by me? Why or why not? Whatever the answer is, Anything that's untrustworthy is because of something that's not his will in our lives. And sometimes we have blind spots. Sometimes it takes somebody else to say, hey, this is why. It's a whole lot easier when you ask though, right? It's hard when somebody just wants to tell you where you're making mistakes. My hope is is that's not what the church is. We're not here to tell everybody their problems. We're here to help people out of them. We're here to help people give them over to God. And the only way that anyone can do that is if they see you do it. It worked for you? Wow. Well, I don't even know what that means. I I, want to give it to Jesus. You know why I struggle as a father? It's not because I don't trust my kids, even though I don't trust them at all. It's because I don't trust the world around them. Right? Yeah, it's my problem too. But here's the thing. That's my failure. Not the world's. Not theirs. And not God's. It's my failure. God calls us to trust him. He's the barrier between the bad that could be and the good that should be. And unless we allow him to take his place, we'll always fight that battle and we can't win. I was so frustrated one day earlier this week. I've shared with some of you a little bit about having some stomach issues and some things going on. And this week I started some antibiotics and I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of taking meds. I'm not a fan of taking 12 meds a day. Now, it's not 12 antibiotics. I got a good doctor. Don't worry. We've got a lot of people around us. Natural things, all of the above. So, but all that to say, I don't want to do that. I want to do the right things and not have to do these things. But that's probably one of the reasons why I'm here today. It's because some of the right things haven't been done and hadn't done any of that either. So God can shake us up sometimes, but 
I was in the car with Alice, my three-year-old headed to pick up Anne, our 12-year-old at school, and I wasn't talking to Alice. I don't know if I was just upset and she could tell. But all of a sudden, I hear her singing in the back. She doesn't even know the words. <laughs> she was singing, every fear I lay at your feet, I sing too. The battle belongs to you. And I thought, wow. Thanks, Lord. God can use anybody in our lives. He's been using my three-year-old a whole lot. (laughs) Not only can he, but he will if we pay attention, if we listen. 2 Chronicles 3 says, do not be afraid or discouraged for the battle. It's not yours. I don't just think about my family that's struggling. I think about your families. I think about what you guys are going through. And it breaks my heart. Hopefully it breaks my heart because that's the spirit of God living inside of me saying, oh, I know, son, it breaks mine too. But the more it breaks our hearts, the more we see these things and and we're encouraged to, to, to lift up those around us, to stand with those around us, the more we'll see a difference, the more we'll find favor with God and man. Ephesians 6 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a very real enemy, and it ain't you, it ain't me, or anyone inside or outside these walls. God says, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. This is my fight. Follow me. Resist the enemy and he will flee. We're going to dive into some really simple ways of hitting this idea of trust issues over these next few weeks. And so I just encourage you, join us, invite somebody, somebody who might be hurting, somebody who could use some community, some uplifting. We're already seeing it happen. The more we act and look and follow Jesus, the more we'll find the favor that we're looking for. Favor, what's favor? Favor is the peace of God that passes all understanding. Favor is the joy that's our strength. Favor is knowing that our path is gonna be straight. Would you bow your heads with me? South Hills Church, I just wanna take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gift, gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.